Uh, on behalf of uh, ILRI and uh, Venture 37, I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, the second part of our webinar, webinar series. This one on One Health, the critical crossroads of animal, human, and environmental health. Environment health. How do we really scale up One Health? Uh, my name's Michael Victor. I'm the head of communications and knowledge management at, uh, at ILRI. Uh, and just wanted to mention that this is the uh, second in the series. The first one I uh, was focused on uh, uh, was focused on uh, leveraging livestock to combat net malnutrition. And I did put the link to the webinar in the uh, chat so you can view it there. So just as we get started, it'd be great to if everyone could put their full name and organization uh, on their name. So you just uh, go to your name, uh, click on more, and you can then uh, click on rename. So you should be able to rename and put your full name and your organization. Helps everyone identify who is here. You can also add your country if you want. Uh, we will be enabling uh, closed captioning, which seems to help a little bit, but there's always often mistakes, So, uh, but it does sometimes help. Uh, remember to keep your microphones off when not speaking. I think most of the people we, we have as a webinar, so you won't have to worry about that. Uh, if you can't see or hear, uh, please close and restart the Zoom. Sometimes things get stuck. Uh, again, we, we are going to be using the chat a lot, so it'd be great if everybody could uh, post questions or comments into the chat. We'll have a moderator who will be able to feed questions uh, to the panel when we have that. And if you have questions to each of the speakers, please uh, put them into the chat and they can answer directly uh, during the webinar. Uh, and just remember that the session is recorded uh, and any private chats are often, also, off, often visible to us as well. We will also be uh, live tweeting. Uh, so please, uh, you know, please recognize that and we'll, we'll be uh, tweeting. So you can also tweet. Uh, use the hashtag, please, uh, why livestock matter. Uh, which helps a lot. Maybe Susan can put that into the chat. Okay, great. So with that, I'd like to introduce Mark Mitchell to uh, to kick us off and take us through the rest of the webinar. Thanks a lot, and over to you, Mark. All right. Thank you, Michael. And I'm Mark Mitchell. I'm the Director of uh, Livestock and Dairy Activities with Venture 37, and we're going to set the context for today's discussion with this short film. It concerns land use policies, um, and how at times they can be unintended, unintended consequences, often at the expense of the ecosystems. This video is on the privatization of land and around the uh, Mara, Serengeti, and Kenya, and Tanzania, and demonstrates how diseases can spread when wild, wildlife, livestock, and humans cross over into each other's spaces. It's an integrated approach, and we Take it away, please. Start to think. Wa kimasai, kwa na mfugo mingi, jina yake inaenda juu na kitambulika kwa community. Kwa hivyo ni muhimu sana kuwa na mfugo. Kulingana na culture, sisi ni wafugaji. Tunafuga kondo, ngombe, mwuzi. Kuna mapato tunapata kwa hawa nyama. Nama nyama, damu, na masiwa malisho kitambo ilikuwa tofauti tulikuwa tunapeleka ngombe hata kilomita 20 30 au 40 na unatembea kila mali unataka sasa sasa hizi imebadilika conservancy zinaanziwa pia siko restricted wa ngomba hizi ingia mimi hapa nafanya biashara nafanya bid work lakini nafanya generally kama shop Nauza vitu kama snacks, sodas, lakini kwa hiyo mchanganyiko nafuga mbuzi, ngombe, kondo, mkona chache kiazi yenye inani saidia. Kuneza lisha kwa shamba yako hata ingawaji shamba ni kidogo, sasa inabidi tena mbaka upeleke kule pake wa sabu ndio kuna uwanja kubwa, ili waende wa changanyane huko na wanyama, wakule nyasi, sababu huko kuna nyasi ya kutosha. Changamoto zenye tunapata sana sana tukichanganya wanyama wa porini na mifugo wanaenda sometimes wana wanapata magonjo. Nabidi tena lazima ukuje uwatibu lakini lazima tu wachanganyike kwa sababu kule ndio kuna 
nyasi ya kutosha. The Masai Mara situation in Kenya is a classic example of what happens when landscape policies are developed without a one health approach. This is because One Health supports integrated management of landscapes that enhance sustainable coexistence of agriculture and wildlife. Many experts, such as ecologists, vets, public health professionals, and others, need to be involved in government and private sector decision making and planning processes. Tuko na shida ya fizi, sinaingia kwa boma, ndiyo wanaanza kuwaua nini. Ina happen tu kama mara mbili. Kuzuia wanyama aziue wanyama zetu, karibu kila familia iko na umbo wao. Sasa wakinuza wanaanza kubaka. Sasa ndiyo zi tunatoka kwa manyumba, ndiyo tusunguke tuone ama tuanze tukuza wanyama. Juzi ama last year kulikuwa na hii shida hizi wanyama wapore. Kulikana vile hiyo umbo zimeumwa. Inaanza kupata kicha. Sasa kwa boma hata inaweza tembea ilileta shida sana hata mpaka inauma watoto. Kuna hata watu wazima iliuma. Ilikuwa na shida sana. Rebis ni trade kwa community ya Masai Mara. So tu, nikipata nikiwa ground hiyo case na report immediately kwa ofisi ya hiyo area inatokezea tuna vaccinate hizo umbwa zenu zikoko. Na umbwa akiwa na rebis akiuma binadamu ina inashukua na hiyo ugonjwa na ni risk sana mpaka sasa uende utibiwe ukiwa mtu na watu wa health tena akiwa akiuma tena ngombe inashukua na hiyo na hiyo ugonjwa wild beast migration sina kujanga wakikuja kuna ugonjwa mwingine inaitwa malignant kata viva which is mcf wakisa ngombe zikikula hizo nini inashukua na hiyo ugonjwa yenye inaitwa malignant kata viva na hiyo na semanga ina dawa no cure the choices we make about ecosystems have important consequences sometimes unintended ones on human and animal health a one health approach helps reduce further destruction and fragmentation of wild habitats incorporating biodiversity values while at the same time considering the health and nutrition needs of people Okay, thank you. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Christina Rossell. She is a scientist in the Animal and Human Health Program at ILRI. Christina holds a diploma of veterinary medicine and a PhD in biomedical sciences. She has led a number of projects on One Health and now leads a new ILRI-led BMZ investment on improving animal and human health in Uganda and helps conceptualize the BMZ-funded ILRI One Health Center for Africa, which we'll hear about more in our panel discussion. Her particular interests include research on the epidemiology of diseases and the interface of livestock, wildlife, and human health, uh, parasitology, working with students well in the North-South and the South-South technology, and the knowledge transfer. And uh, we welcome you here today, Christina. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, uh, sorry to everyone who expected Delia here today. I am stepping in for her today. And um, yes, I want to talk about the role of livestock research at the One Health interface today, uh, just to set the scene for the following panelists. And um, coming from Ilri, of course, our core business is livestock research, and uh, we are working based on a number of opportunities and challenges that have been identified over the years. And one of the biggest challenges is probably how to feed the global population in the future, um, because population growth is one of the biggest issues pressuring um, our planet. And we see that there's big disparity between um, current meat or animal source food consumption between high income and low and middle income countries. And the majority of the population growth will happen in the global south in the future. That's also where a lot of the 
essential is for growth of the sector, for um, opportunities to reduce poverty, um, increase equity and livelihoods. However, all these things come with a lot of um, challenges um, and not only at a local level, but also regional and global level. That is of course the emergence of uh, yeah, zoonotic diseases. We know that more than two thirds of the pathogens, they originate in, in animals and at some point in time um, have a spillover event to humans. Also uh, increased livestock production comes with an increase of uh, yeah, drugs, antimicrobials, or keep the livestock healthy, which comes with a lot of pressure on the environment and um, microbes and increasing the risk for antimicrobial resistance. More livestock also means more methane contributing to greenhouse gas emissions and of course global warming, which needs to be um, limited. And of course, the more mammals for food or for eating that food live on this planet, um, the more we have environmental pollution, land and water degradation, which again, increases um, the risk for spillover. So some of the key one health elements um, that we focus on are to be prepared, to detect and to respond. And all of them, just like in the One Health Venn diagram, where all these three different circles uh, overlap, also these three components, preparedness, detection, and response, they also overlap. Um, they cannot be seen in independently. And I'll give a few examples today. And I think the following speakers, they will then go more into the details and give more examples from their work. So, to be prepared, we need to know where to put our money. Uh, that's always a, a, a big question by investors. Um, we want to solve all problems at the same time. We don't know uh, where to target investments. Uh, often we come too late and try and solve problems when they're already there. So data is one of the biggest issues we face in the global south. We don't have data to prioritize. We don't have data for surveillance and monitoring, and therefore we also lack data to target our interventions and limited resources. So that is one of the major contributions that um, livestock research can make. On top of that, uh, we have to utilize what we have, and that is a lot of local capacity. We don't have to take um, interventions that have worked in the North and implement them in the South and expect the same results. We have to utilize local knowledge. We have to localize uh, yeah, local resources, local capacity, and try and build this capacity, improve this capacity, instead of trying to reinvent the wheel. And I think Bernard will talk more about this later. And by being um, prepared and investing early enough in data generation and building local capacity, we can actually save a lot of money. As these two examples show investment in yellow uh, in, the, um, uh, in the right figure, investment in keeping poultry, uh, vaccinating poultry uh, against avian influenza can really reduce the economic um, burden on, uh, on affected countries. Um, uh, the second component is detection. And that's where biomedical sciences come in, of course, but also social sciences. And of course, we need to understand these different zoonotic pathogens. We need to understand where they come from, where they live, how they survive in the environment. Is it mosquitoes? Is it waters? Is it wildlife reservoirs? Is it livestock reservoirs? We need to understand the process from infection uh, of humans uh, and animals uh, to the host immune response. So we can also be able to develop diagnostic tools and vaccines. And then we need to consolidate all this information that we have and uh, develop strategies to target those. And one example is shown here on the right. Uh, that work is mostly generated by Bernard and Tim. Um, 
we look at data on Rift Valley fever. We do entomological studies. We know animal reservoirs for Rift Valley fever. We know precipitation patterns. We know uh, altitudes. We have all this data, it's out there, and we're trying to fill data gaps with our field surveys. But then this data needs to be consolidated so that decision makers know, okay, we have a vaccine for livestock, let's go to the high risk areas and these are the ones in red and we need this for many of the health subjects and this is a good transition to the response and uh, the response is not just about having a vaccine ready it's also about getting to the vaccine to those people who need it and covid is one of these examples in a in a global effort and a miracle we have a vaccine already but in East Africa and other parts of Africa and Southeast Asia, many people have not yet benefited from the vaccine. It's very difficult to get it to people, uh, to have people accept the vaccine, to have access to it. Governments are struggling with buying vaccines and uh, therefore, yeah, the vaccine is not available and which leads again to a global problem of not having herd immunity through vaccination. COVID is just one example. This happens with uh, a number of the health interventions we are researching. So these um, components, acceptability, accessibility, affordability, availability, and incentives are quite crucial in getting interventions or research into use. And that is also just as the way we're trying to generate data, getting interventions out um, requires participation by uh, the end users communities. And I guess we'll hear a bit more about this, about uh, rangeland uh, land management in a bit. And finally, I wanted to uh, uh, highlight again, two of the recent publications that um, give very constructive advice to investors on where to invest, what research gaps do we still have? Where are the data needs? and how we can intervene in preventing not only the next pandemic, but also preventing other uh, uh, health uh, problems at the human animal environment interface. These are also the neglected zoonotic diseases such as tapeworms, brucellosis, um, sleeping sickness, uh, diseases that usually affect low and middle income countries. Uh, we also have a silent pandemic, antimicrobial resistance. So we're not just talking about the big scares. Um, we give um, yeah, an investment advice to uh, challenge these major anthropogenic drivers of zoonotic disease emergence. So uh, this is my little um, presentation to set the scene. And now to I can take questions if that is in the agenda, Mark. And otherwise, I'll hand back to you. All right, thank you, ma'am. We're gonna switch quickly to, um, uh, let's see, Bernard, and I'm gonna skip through this quickly so that Bernard gains a little time back. And if you are ready to go, Bernard, you can start talking to us about uh, the policy uh, process and the scaling out at your level. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. My name is Bernard Bett. I work with ILRI as a senior scientist, currently heading the One Health Center, which Christina um, mentioned. So um, I'm presenting this fo focusing on how we are planning to scale up, scale out One Health uh, practices and policies in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I'm working with a big team of people, including Lian, Christina, Ashni, Delia, and Hung. This is a project which is funded currently by BMZ. So let's go to the next slide. Yes, so this is first of all to, to clarify or to set up the terminologies that we are using. When we talk about scaling, we really mean an ambitious process to expand the coverage of One Health, either through institu institutionalization, that's making sure that policymakers, right at the national, subnational levels, are able to apply One Health uh, principles. But also there's a component on horizontal expansion. This is involving many other players 
within the same levels of um, application. But in the process of scaling up, we are not just thinking of spreading out, we are only thinking of refining these institutions, these practices, realizing that, you know, we are not really here to start off from the beginning, but many other players have originally set up uh, platforms and, 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 and processes much earlier. So we're just helping to improve on the quality. The main uh, issue though, is to really identify what's that scalable unit, because we know One Health is quite broad. We really need to identify what's the key component of One Health that can be scaled. So let's go to the next slide. And I give examples of vertical scaling. And this again, that's what I meant, institutionalization. And currently we are looking at the platforms which were developed by countries, uh, regional economic blocks, the tripartite and many other players in the region and trying to ask ourselves, what are the competencies? How are these platforms working? So we are using an evaluation tool that's called Network for Evaluation of One Health, which is classical, published, and it's being used in many places to identify those gaps in planning, thinking, working, sharing um, One Health uh, activities. And the main aim here is to identify what, which areas can we specifically implement interventions to make these platforms work much more um, effectively. The second issue though would be research for development. And this is where we're thinking of, we want to demonstrate how new evidence can be used to inform uh, decision-making, but also to, to inform uh, networking partnerships so that it can really come out so clearly on which areas would those partnerships work better for disease control. So on the next slide, I give a small example on horizontal um, scaling. What we do here is basically about building graduate fellowship programs so that we can get more leaders, more students, more technical expertise being used in the region. And it involves training students within here at ILRI, but also helping local universities in developing new curricula. Uh, on One Health. Uh, through our research partnerships, also with governments, NGOs, private sectors, we hope that in the process of us implementing research with them, those um, 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 One Health competencies come out strongly and they get recognized as ways of doing business. But lastly, also is we are really launching community outreach activities which aim to build um, uh, capacities at the local levels, but also there's a frontline staff here, including you know, community-based animal health workers or community health volunteers who are working in the uh, public, uh, public health sector. So all those people are brought on board to work together in the local levels. I think I have the second last slide, which talks about the opportunities that we have to build all these um, activities. And one of them is, um, it's a huge interest locally on building One Health platforms. And I think that interest would really help us to, to move on from there. There's also One Health platforms which have been developed, as I said earlier on. And there's a huge um, skilled manpower in mainstream government departments, which can be brought on board in building all these uh, initiatives. But of course, as you know, there are many challenges. And main, the main one, of course, is being funding levels are low. The other thing is conceptualization of One Health. It's, you know, One Health is quite broad and many people may not really define what we mean by a scalable unit. That needs to be determined for us to know where we begin from and where we reach in terms of taking it forward. Uh, the, the one thing that I also find it very useful is to identify reliable tools for assessment. You know, we keep doing, uh, th there are many tools which are being used currently for assessing scaling in many interventions in veterinary, even public health. But those ones have not really been fine-tuned to capture One Health. And those are the limitations that we still face up to now. Lastly, of course, One Health, as we know it, is very much on prevention of diseases. Of course, it can be used for management of diseases, but most of the time we want to use them for prevention. But we know communities and many people in the, on the ground 
are really very much tailored towards using curative services and not prevent preventive services. And that's this, this need for a mind, mind, uh, change in mindset in terms of how those services are used. So I think I have only the two slides. One is on acknowledging partners, and we have many partners in this region. But the last one, which I want to emphasize, is we have had huge support from um, a CGIR research program called FONH, which was led by IFPRI. For the last 10 years, they have been helping us to do One Health, and it's coming to an end in December this year. So very much um, um, like to acknowledge the support that we have gotten from them. So thanks, Mark. That's the end of my presentation. Okay, thank you, Bernard. Uh, we're gonna quickly switch over to uh, a USDA funded project and hear from uh, Lasha and the situation they're facing in Georgia. Please, Lasha. Thank you, Mark. Greetings. Let me present safety and quality investment livestock, or simply skill activities under the One Health principles. Skill project is financed by the USDA and implemented by the Orlando Lakes Venture 37 in Georgia, with our local partner, Georgian Farmers Association. Following farm to fork principles, project aims to, to support food safety and quality improvement, increase productivity and trade within the Georgian dairy and beef market systems value chain. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, skill major task is to support market systems development. So I would like to focus on how the skill operates in the strengthening one health approach in the market systems development context. System includes value and chain actors, uh, starting from the input suppliers, farmers, processors, distributors, all the way to the final consumers. But also on top of it, the market systems donated, we say, we have a, a role to develop supporting functions, such as strengthening education centers, sectoral trainers, service providers, etc. And let me give an example here. In recently skilled trained call center operators of the Ministry of Environmental Protection and Agriculture of Georgia in animal health and food safety matters. And it was first for them ever such technical training. On the other hand, uh, we try to strengthen local rules and regulations through capacity building of the related uh, state authorities, developing market-led safety and quality systems, and mediating public-private partnership. As an additional example, we conducted a workshop regarding uh, newly adopted regulation and animal byproducts, their use and disposal. Next slide, please. So what are our tools in the toolbox? Uh, as uh, knowledge and awareness of the local sectoral actors was identified as one of the biggest challenges, we uh, conducted a set of the trainings in different wild health related topics. And let, let me give you some examples from this list. Uh, food safety and hygiene principles that included HACCP system for dairy and preprocessors. We also trained all state and private slaughterhouse veterinarians in meat inspection. And as you see on the right in the pictures, the environment of the trainings varies from the actual practice in the processing plant or, or more in kind of community-based interactions. Next slide, please. Also, we try to, to cover gap of de um, developing education materials. Um, such are, for our case, manuals and booklets and guidebooks. For that uh, activity, we had a small motivator, like 120 nanometer small motivator. It's basically all kinds of people, large gatherings is still restricted for more than a year now. So we have to adapt. Materials will print in the distributed through our partners, as well as electronic brochures are uploaded in the local farmers platform. When our uh, partners, let's say, uh, was the National Food Agency and they disseminated these manuals to cattle farmers through their state animal vaccination campaigns. And here on the right, uh, you can see example of one of our education materials regarding veterinary medicine products, which explains the, the health, one health and general health principles, as well as veterinary medicines residues flow from animals to humans to environment. This manual also contains the information regarding antimicrobial resistance, but on more like a simple farmer's understandable language. Next slide, please. And here I have a list of the other materials. 
as you can see on the content of them. And I would uh, highlight a uh, practical manual for the slaughterhouse veterinarians, how to protect farm from the chronic disease, as well as a manual on the vector uh, disease prevention is also pending. Next place, slide, please. In order to promote those education materials, skill developed animated videos that you can see. These videos are simple way reflecting the key messages of the education materials. These videos were disseminated through the social media and popular regional televisions. Uh, and I believe that the strength of this concept was to provide the awareness regarding the main highlights of that very subject. But also at the same time, aware target groups regarding existence of these very materials to be either downloaded from the web platform or gained through the skill partners. So with this approach, we are able to educate target beneficiaries through the combined method of the videos plus manuals that uh, do not actually require the gathering of uh, the people and it's also a cost effective. As a challenge that we identified in the process, access of the electronic platform by the farmers is quite limited. But on the other hand, on the opportunity side, we think and we're planning to translate those education materials into English, which are currently in Georgian, to share amongst other Venture 37 projects. Next slide, please. And basically that's the final slide. So we try to adopt to the, to the existing uh, pandemic situation by uh, providing and disseminating knowledge regarding One Health principles and related actions in livestock sector market systems. And that's the way it is. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Lasha. And the last of our speed talks here, it will come from Medessa and the Ilri Hill program. If you could uh, please start that discussion. Uh, my name is Bada Saiba. I work for International Livestock Research Institute. Uh, I'm a regular scientist. The topic I'm going to talk on is linking rangeland management to One Health in Ethiopia. Uh, rangeland is important for One Health because this rangeland is a vast uh, land area that covers uh, the whole service. And also, it is support uh, millions of people, as pastoralists, who are depending on the rangeland through rearing of uh, livestock production. And also, it is good for ecosystem service functioning well, uh, so that uh, One Health uh, brings these three components, by including the rangeland health, to improve the livelihood and the ecosystem service for the community who are living there. Uh, one of the projects which is integrating the uh, environmental aspect is HEAL. Uh, this project is uh, actually the constant group led by VCFCUs along with uh, CCM and the EARLY as, with the objective of to enhance the vulnerable community uh, to have a sustainable uh, 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 well-being. Uh, that the project is conducted in three, in three countries, Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia, uh, with an approach of bringing three, these three components, animal, human, environmental health, to have a good delivery service uh, of one health service at the ground level for the pastoralist. And this project also uh, engage different community levels, including women, men, to have, uh, to accommodate their need that, uh, that to have a one health service delivery and also to have a cost-effective approach for this, this uh, one health service delivery. And as in the, at the end of the day, this should be a model or a solution of sil silver, um, silver service delivery uh, that should be recognized by different token like a policy maker for the pastoralist as a whole. Uh, most of the initiative of one health is lacking this environmental health. So, He'll make unique because of including this one health, uh, uh, environmental health through an approach of participatory rangeland management. This participatory rangeland management has three stages uh, and a different uh, uh, eight of uh, different steps. So this actually a process uh, that uh, maintains the community management plan and improving uh, the institution of this uh, community uh, rangeland, man, man, rangeland management. F from this, uh, from rangeland, 
there is a livestock disease distribution and also there are different rangeland conditions. So the disease and uh, rangeland condition are highly integrated or correlated. Uh, they are functioning to each other. So this PRM is uh, bringing into the process of animal disease to be integrated well. From, for example, if we take uh, from our uh, one site at Daula Rangeland, which is found in Moyale district, how one health and the grazing are uh, really uh, linked together show us movement uh, through concentration of livestock and high degradation of uh, rangeland shows us how one health is and the grazing are uh, integrated. Uh, uh, from this, uh, uh, an institutional role uh, to, bring to bring together a different institutions which are uh, to act for one health center uh, to learn from each other, uh, he uh, developed uh, MSIP uh, for stakeholders to discuss a learning because of uh, uh, environmental health is uh, broader, so that to understand what rangeland health means. So MSIP is a most like a style, uh, stakeholder innovation platform where uh, uh, many stakeholders are really from each other. Or to avoid the challenges of not understanding the uh, whole uh, environment from this uh, rangeland health. So the service delivery is to uh, improve the rangeland which are highly degraded or to uh, minimize, uh, to maintain the rangeland size as it is, to, to have uneducated pasture. As a sum up, uh, rangeland health is a key improving uh, the whole system of the ecosystem and the productivity of uh, the whole area that improve the livelihood and the uh, community as well, so that bringing of animal, human, uh, rangeland health is a good uh, to link to rangeland management to have a wider uh, impact of the livelihood of uh, communities. So thank you. Uh, if you have question, welcome. Uh, thank you, um, Odessa. Um, we've now heard from uh, three different programs and how they are scaling One Health in policy, uh, training, public and private sector activities, and environmental pathways. And we're going to change over to some questions now. And I'd like to lead off by asking Bernard how they've been able to reconcile the differing interests between their stakeholders. Uh, we naturally find that there's a little bit of difference between what donors want, what local governments want, and what livestock owners want. And I'd like to hear your views on uh, this process. Yeah, thanks, Mark, uh, Mark, for that question. So, um, yes, you are right. I mean, most of the donors or most of the development agencies usually fund those challenges or those, those issues which address epidemics, pandemics with international concern. Usually they look at uh, risks which transcend countries and, and, and regions. But we, we, we find that the, the, the stakeholders or the, the, the people we deal with at the community level are very much interested in managing day-to-day -day challenges in terms of endemic diseases or things which we call production, um, which may not really attract external um, um, uh, interest. So, but I think there is a win-win, um, um, th there's a room for win-win situation there because the support we get from external uh, development partners which address pandemics and epidemics can still help in building universal surveillance systems or build capacity which might be used to manage multiple challenges at the same time. So in that way, I think um, you can still find a common ground where that external support can still be used to build capacity even to manage local problems. Thank you, sir. Uh, Lasha, I'm gonna turn to you next to kind of follow the order of the speakers there. And curious how you're building capacity at the farm level to prevent the spread of zoonotic disease. What, what are producers, uh, the livestock owners' knowledge and awareness of One Health challenges? How, how are they facing this? 
Uh, well, Mark, um, as I mentioned during my presentation, uh, one of the skill developed uh, education material was manual for main chronic diseases of cattle. And for Georgia, that would be uh, brucellosis, tuberculosis, and leukosis. So we developed a manual that contains the practical examples of the clinical science, disease prevention, also diagnostic practices. Uh, manual also explains kind of uh, existing regulations and also explains that this is very important, the primary actions to be taken in case of the disease suspicious before even the veterinarian's engagement. Also, we put like sticky posters of the disease clinical signs and also key messages that uh, are attached to the manual. And these um, owners of these uh, farms that have, they have been de delivered could stick them on the walls of the employees sitting around. So they will have always the major information in front of them, the abortion and other clinical signs and also highlight and also clinical signs in humans as well. So they would you know, understand that they might be exposed. So in my opinion, that's the, the practical example how to aware uh, kind of farmers on one health issues and try to get them on our LAs. Thank you. Um, and Bedessa, we're looking at the environmental part of our tripartite and, and we diagram One Health. Why is it, is it challenging to incorporate One Health into the environmental issues? Thank you, Mark. Uh, uh, yes, it is. Uh, if you see many of uh, the one health initiatives, the environmental health is uh, lacking. Uh, it is neglected uh, many initiatives. This may, may be because of uh, this environmental research uh, is uh, less funding to have uh, 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 to integrate this. And also it is not taken as like seriously as uh, other discipline like uh, medical and also even to the veterinary issue. And uh, uh, there also this environmental ha also have uh, different theories, uh, which is not contextual to different uh, areas. Like if we take a series of uh, indigenous pastoralists, which is sometimes uh, they are uh, conflict each other uh, in some areas. So that this is uh, the main point why the environment is not as uh, the others. Okay, thank you for that interesting bit of information. You know, we, we've labeled this as a hard talk session. And so the hardest question I'm gonna pose back to uh, Christina where she, she led us off today. And as a thought leader in this field, where does the focus on One Health and livestock provide the greatest impact? Um, yeah, well, there's not a silver bullet answer to that because the context of any health problem is different in each country, right? So I, I think uh, the, the focus should be on, um, yeah, the, the local context actually in which the, the animal diseases, um, yeah, navigate and the pathogens navigate. And that's uh, the reason why I'm saying this in Southeast Asia, for example, where you have a much higher pig population, uh, you know, uh, pigs as a livestock species would be of much uh, of more importance than um, cattle and small ruminants mm -hmm. in, in East Africa, for example. And maybe I would like to pass this on to, to my colleague, Bernard, who is more of a, of a, a, a local leader in One Health than I am. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, sure, Bernard, if you would like to follow up, please. No, I think Christina managed it well by saying, you know, it change, it, it varies from one place to another. Maybe what one thing that jumped into mind because I can see in your question is a, there's a labeling of livestock. And since we are thinking of one health, you know, livestock usually is considered to be under resourced in many places. And so I guess bringing in one health in that perspective might actually help to enhance service delivery, not just looking at um, a disease per se, but also managing multiple uh, facets of livestock service delivery. In this region, for example, you know, many, many remote locations 
there's a big challenge on that. And so I see One Health can really help us to reach into the those people who are, who are considered to be left behind by previous interventions. Okay, thank you. We, we have a couple of extra minutes. Is uh, there are specific questions from the chat box that anyone would like to draw my attention to? Um, otherwise, I'm going to jump to one of our other questions here. What I'd like to ask is each of you just quickly to give me um, a quick answer to say if which part of One Health changes or the program implementation that you've dealt with has been the most difficult? Has it been with the local governments, the private sector, the veterinarians or the community animal health workers or the farmers themselves? And Bernard, if I could start with you, which, which of those um, uh, partners in all of this has been the, the, the slowest to make change? That's a difficult question. I would say government because, um, you know, if you look at the other actors which you have in the list, if an intervention is really beneficial to them, they will adjust immediately, you know, a private sector farmers, but for government, you know, you really need to put in place policies, rules before everybody else come to the same table. So I think for me, it will be government. Okay. And Lasha, how would you, uh, talk about this that question. That's tough, Mark, but probably for us, it's engagement of the farmers. Um, because to let them understand that something which is not always linked to their income, um, sometimes opposite, uh, that matters. For instance, like antimicrobial resistance, a proper use of the veterinary medicine products, proper waste of uh, byproducts, etc. That could, I mean, this process is a slow process and needs some more and more engagement from all the partners. Okay. And the same question to you, uh, Bedessa. What uh, uh, part of the partnership has been difficult for you? It's hard, actually. Uh, it is from a uh, perspective of like a because I've seen this environment and also because it is a, an understanding of uh, health aspect is somewhat is different from uh, rangeland because it is a government and uh, if you are low, like we see from a uh, pastoralist point of view different organization are there so in some of them also say government okay thank you and we have one question that's come in uh from um abdel fatha and uh, what are your thoughts on selecting for poultry or livestock that are genetically um, uh, predisposed or uh, uh, resistant to any of the avian influenza or other diseases? And uh, what's work is being done on the crossbreds uh, for that process? I'm not quite sure who, who is best to answer that question if you'd like to speak up. Do we, do we have someone who's been handling uh, the selection of poultry and livestock for genetic and avian influenza? Um, uh, we already had a discussion on that in the chat. This is Christina. <laughs> and uh, I mean, uh, I'm not speaking for Ilri. We are not uh, working on, on um, uh, selecting breeds uh, resistant to avian influenza. We do that kind of work. Um, Breeding and crossbreeding um, disease resistant animals, even genetic engineering um, yeah, to generate um, uh, disease resistant animals. But uh, yeah, it can work in the lab. You still need to get it to the community. So, one of the examples I, I, I brought up was the gamma cattle from West Africa, which is very small but resistant to trypanosoma infections, and the Maasai herders in East Africa really didn't like it because it was too small, not considered a real cow. So even though that, that cattle breed was resistant to disease, they opted for the disease. So, uh, and, and we have other examples where we are trying to crossbreed um, 
cheap that are resistant to uh, worm infections. Uh, and it's definitely a good biomedical or genetical approach to disease control. And But it's others working on the avian influenza breeding. Thanks. I hope that helps a bit. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it, it looks like a good question has come up for, um, uh, looks like Bernard or Bedessa, and the question is, zoonotic infections form the bulk of re-emerging or emerging disease burden that could benefit the attention of One Health and management. What is being done to actually manage the introductions from wildlife? So I think uh, that might be closer to uh, uh, Bedessa. Yeah, uh, I'm, uh, in my perspective view, uh, because that's why we put a participatory rangeland management bring to this uh, one health approach to increase this rangeland management. If we have integrated integrated management plan, uh, this all things should be minimized to absorb this uh, the issue of health, health for management actually the wild five. So now we are like, uh, if we take the pastoral area, there is a wildlife, there is a cli climate change, uh, there is a land health. Uh, so these are under the umbrella of environment. So we are doing uh, in this hill project uh, by combining together, having a, a strong uh, integrated management plan to be integrated into one health. Um, and I've noticed that uh, Lasha would like to speak on that as well as we think through uh, the question on this crossover from uh, from wildlife. Lasha, please. Thank you, Mark. So actually one of the uh, materials that we also developed is regarding how to build the cattle farm. And that also includes how to select a place, a lot of about biosecurity measures and all the threats that come to the farm from the wildlife, from the impact Supported animals and other sources, but and that's I believe is part of the answer as well. How to separate or how to protect the, the livestock and therefore the humans later on from the right. wildlife. Okay, we're going to squeeze in one last question, and um, um, anyone can pop in on this answer. Okay, what is the one thing that we could do today that would improve or motivate buy-in from One Health around the world? Is it you know, the livestock, the livestock owners, the funding, the people were involved, or is it the markets that we need to put pressure on? How, how would you guys um, discuss this topic? Who, who would like to go first? How about um, Bernard? You've been quick on the answers today. Oh, well, yeah, that's, that's really a, a big question. So, I would, I would say I think if we get um, a stronger consumer demand on 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 healthy and you know healthy landscapes and healthy food, I think they can drive much more than just you know a supply side of things. So I think the demand can really shape how more healthy value chains can be developed. And I'm hoping that would really also force the private sector to come into in, in, into into the picture much more. Okay, Lasha, let's build on that private sector notion. How would you uh, answer the question? Well, actually, Mark, now we're on the way of developing the market-led uh, food safety and quality standard on a primary production level. And I agree with uh, Bernard that uh, yes, they, indeed, the consumers awareness, uh, demand from the consumers needs to be there, but also we should support the, the production and primary production processing level to, to meet up the standards, the standards that sets the government, but also especially the market led standards that motivates the, the processors to, to move on. Thank you, sir. Well, We've heard from our panelists now, and I want to give time for a wrap up here from uh, Christine Yost. She's the Global Health Security Initiative um, Senior Livestock Advisor with USAID's Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance. Um, she provides technical support 
on saving lives and livelihoods of livestock keepers and fisher folk. She liaises with global uh, humanitarian and resilience communities on issues regarding food security and food systems, animal health, emerging and transparent diseases. She has over 30 years of experience and working in over 40 countries. And so we'd like to use her expertise to uh, put a final note on today's webinar. Christine, please. Thank you, Mark, and, and thank you to all of the speakers today. I've really learned a lot. I want to highlight a few things. I liked how um, the speakers were kind of organized uh, in research policy and then really looking at practice. From Christina, we learned about the importance of preparing, detecting, and responding um, in One Health approaches, preparing in terms of particularly focusing on localization, um, detection, and both, both the importance of the biomedical and the social sciences. Um, you know, it's important to remember that disease isn't simply a biological problem. It's a socioeconomic problem requiring one health approaches. And then responding in terms of coordination and targeting at all levels. One of our main lessons from responding to the Ebola outbreak in West Africa that ended in 2016 was the need for improved coordination. And it's a lesson we are learning again in the COVID-19 pandemic. From Bernard, we were introduced to the One Health Regional Center for Africa with its focus on policy and scaling. And it was good uh, to, to, to hear Bernard recognize the challenge of conceptualizing um, One Health um, and the need to integrate that into scaling approaches, um, both at uh, the in in public efforts such as the national One Health platforms, as well as graduate programs and community outreach. And then from Lasha and Badessa, we we really had a nice look into um, examples of putting One Health into practice, both in um, market systems as well as in terms of linking rangeland health to One Health. What came out from the discussion and the contribution of the participants for me is that One Health is not just an approach to research. It's also an approach to practice, policy, capacity building that recognizes and supports the inextricable linkages between environmental, animal, and human health. As livestock experts, we need to continually challenge ourselves to think about and address what livestock research and development means for the health and well-being of people and the environments in which we live and how often we should be asking ourselves, are we collaborating with the ecological and human health communities? Thanks, Mark. Uh, thank you. I'm gonna hand back over to Michael now and he'll take walk us through our ending points. Thank you all for attending. Hi, thanks a lot, Mark. And thanks a lot, Christine. That was really interesting. Uh, with that, it would just be really great to hear uh, from everybody, if they can put into the chat, just uh, what were your main messages uh, that came out of the uh, that came out of the webinar? Be really good to to see what people want. Uh, and as we're as people are as you're typing that in, please type it in, and uh, and we'll take a look at what you have. Uh, we will be having a, another webinar, hopefully before the end of the year. We'll let you know. Uh, all the, the presentation and the, uh, the recording we will send out to everybody as well. Uh, so let's see, does anybody have any key comments? Uh, Andres had some, something about where can they find more reading about One Health? Uh, maybe Christina could put some, some uh, links there. We have a One Health page on the ILRI website as well. The, the Gregorian Georgia Experience Skill Program. Program has a yeah. Facebook page that will direct you to a lot of materials there as well. And all to the, so to the Georgia Farmers Association, GFA. Excellent. Okay, let's see if there's anything else. Uh, if not, I think we're, we've uh, come to the end and perfect timing. Good job, Mark. I'd like to really thank everyone behind the scenes. We had uh, Madeline, uh, Madeline Botlis from Venture 37. We had Tessa Martin from Venture 37. Uh, Murray uh, from uh, Ilri. We had uh, Susan and we have uh, Jeffrey uh, as well, all kind of helping out and really helping to make this, uh, this webinar series go. Uh, I'd also like again to thank Christina for really jumping in. And fortunately, Delia couldn't come today as well. Uh, but really, this was a, a nice uh, conversation, and uh, thank you, everyone, for attending.